Hello, and welcome to the fifth lecture in the lecture series on application of big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in scanning probe and electron microscopy. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the application of the supervised and unsupervised learning in scanning transmission electron microscopy. My name is Sergei Kalinin, and I work at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So in this lecture, we are going to briefly talk about why would we need to apply big data machine learning and artificial intelligence in electron microscopy, briefly discuss the application of the nonlinear and linear unmixing methods, such as principal component analysis, non-negative matrix factorization, and Bayesian linear unmixing, for analysis of the electron energy loss spectroscopy or EELS spectrum imaging and for analysis of the four-dimensional stem or tychography. We are going to talk about the image analytics using global and sliding Fourier transform and briefly talk about the analysis based on atom extraction and local crystallography. By the end of the talk, we are going to look at few snippets on the application of the deep learning in image analytics and STEM. As the reminder, this lecture covers some of the historical aspects of the machine learning and STEM, sort of roughly from the year 2018 to year 2008. And uh, stay tuned to the short lectures coming in the future dedicated to the current effort in this area. So, why are we interested in applying machine learning in electron microscopy in the first case? And the answer is that in the last uh, 10 years or so, these techniques evolved from a mere imaging technique to a quantitative probe on the structure and functionalities on the atomic level. So let's look at this, uh, at this roadmap. So the first aberration characters appeared around the year 1997, so almost 20 years ago, and they were introduced by the NEON, and that allowed reliable imaging of the atomic columns. In 2002, the prototype characters become available to the broad scientific community, so this was the year when I started at Oak Ridge, and uh, I observed firsthand how the first characters were installed on the 501 and 603 microscopes. And very quickly, these systems allowed the very new insights in the structure and functionality of the materials. So very quickly after the demonstration of the atomically resolved imaging, uh, the spectra of the single atoms were demonstrated. In 2006, the Berkeley lab led the team project, so the first broad uh, incorporation of the aberration corrected machines, and uh, imaging of the light atoms and the beam sensitive materials has become possible. Around 2012, the aberration corrected machines have become commercially available. So from that moment on, if you have several million dollars and low noise facility, you can basically buy one. And interestingly, this uh, gave rise to the full spectrum of new imaging techniques. So in 2014, the methods based on the segmented detectors and shortly thereafter on the use of the four-dimensional stem or diffraction from atomic volumes have appeared. The groups in uh, Ruska Institute and Oak Ridge have demonstrated that it's possible to use the beams with the orbital momentum to map the spin and magnetic phenomena. And very recently, it has was shown that we can use the electron beam to actually manipulate atoms and solids, much like uh, scanning tunneling microscopy was used for atomic fabrication 30 years ago. So if we look at the full spectrum of the electron microscopy techniques available now, we can see that both on the size of the electron beam source, sample environments, detectors, and uh, data generation system, 
there have been remarkable number of breakthroughs. So obviously they were incorporated at different systems and different locations. But if we combine them together, it is very clear that uh, high resolution electron microscopy is perhaps one of the most promising techniques for probing and manipulating matter on the atomic scale. However, the question becomes is that given all these developments on the instrument side, what are we going to do with the data? And this is something that spurred us to engage in the development of the techniques for automatic image and the spectrum analysis in STEM. So, how would we define the general challenge of learning from scanning transmission, electron microscopy, and scanning probe microscopy data? So, in principle, we can divide our problem in the four specific areas. So, the first one is whether we can get material specific functionalities and information from microscopy data. For example, to which degree can we learn the atomic coordinates from stem data or scattering potentials from 4D stem and so on and so forth? At which level of the confidence can we do that? And how this knowledge is affected by the knowledge of the imaging system? The second problem is, uh, can we learn this material specific information with uncertainties determined by the incomplete knowledge of imaging system to recover the correlative models or generative physics of the material, for example, force fields, exchange integrals, and so on and so forth. The third challenge is that whether we can use the material information, whether it is correlative or causative, to understand and forward predict materials behavior in a broad parameter space. For example, construct the phase diagrams, predict the functionalities, the function of external stimuli, and so on and so forth. Notice that of these challenges, the first one is something that the electron microscopy or scanning probe microscopy communities are focused at. So this is what microscopists are doing. The third one is something that the theorists are doing. But the second one, how do we learn materials physics from the images is largely missing. Interestingly enough, it's uh, not universal. For example, astronomy, which is uh, not an experimental science, it's observational science. Astronomers know how to reconstruct the models of the universe based on the observation. So the question becomes, can we use the same techniques and methods augmented or enabled by the machine learning and artificial intelligence for microscopic data set. And the price in this case would be that machine learning methods, once they develop, tend to be fast, which means that in addition to learning materials, physics, and chemistry, we can also endanger the real-time feedback from our analysis of machine learning system back to the microscope to enable the autonomous experimentation, atomic manipulation, and so on and so forth. So how can we do that? Where do we start? The answer is that we need to start with the exploratory data analysis. Let me show you a few examples of the techniques when it is necessary. So in scanning transmission electron microscopy, chronologically first area where the machine learning methods were applied was the energy loss spectroscopy or EELS. So what you see on this slide is the example of the uh, three component film where you have the strontium titanate substrate. Grown on the strontium titanate is the lanthanum strontium manganate electrode. And then grown on top of it is the bismuth ferrite. So what we can do is select this region inside this material and take multiple yield spectra. And when you look at the spectra, you can see that they're pretty complex. They have a lot of peaks that can be roughly interpreted as surface plasmons, volume plasmons. You can see the electronic edges corresponding to titanium M, magnesium and iron M, and then lanthanum N regions. The question becomes, if we have multiple spectra within the structure, can we somehow simplify it? Can we learn how many components are inside the system? For example, as you can see on this graph, the blue curve corresponds to the yield spectrum 
collected across the interface. So is it a new phase or it is just a geometric sum of the signals from the adjacent phases? So how can we answer this question? Another example, perhaps a little bit less obvious, is so-called tychography of 4D stem. So in this case, we have our electron beam focused on the material with the uh, beam volume being generally smaller than atomic spacing. We generate diffraction from the subatomic volume. And by the nature of the process, we generate the diffraction over the square grid of points. So the question becomes, what are we going to do with this four-dimensional data set? Another example would be the image analysis. So we have an image. In this case, this is a scanning transmission, a scanning tunneling microscopy. We can treat the image, the collection of the overlapping sub-images. So in this manner, this two-dimensional image is transformed into the four-dimensional image uh, where each element contains the sub-image of the original one. The question becomes, how can we extract the information in those images through Fourier transform, correlation functions, intensity histogram, structural descriptors, and so on and so forth. So the te first technique that comes in handy in those cases is the techniques based on the general linear unmixing methods. So what it is is, imagine that we have uh, our data cube. So this is our hyperspectral image, either ILS, or tychography or collection of the sub-images and we represent the each entry in this data cube as a linear combination of the end members multiplied by some loading maps. In this case all the information on the dependence of our signal on the parameter for example the ELS intensity on energy is contained in the end members. And all the information about the spatial localization of the signal is contained in the loading maps. So in some sense, we take our data cube or high dimensional object and split it in the collection of elementary spectra and collection of this loading maps. And then we say that each uh, data cube can be represented as just the linear combination of those. So for many of these methods, the number of the elements in the total decomposition is exactly the same in the original data set. However, not all of them will contain useful information. In fact, our linear mixing methods can be optimized in such a way that the useful information is contained only in the first several elements. So we can truncate this decomposition at the first and early stages. Let's look at the example. The simplest case for this uh, unmixing methods would be the multiple linear regression, which is wonderful method, which applies when we know exactly what are our elementary spectra. So in this case, we represent our unknown data set as the linear combination with the coefficients which are dependent on position of known end members. Of course, we always have the noise uh, term, which is kind of necessary. So this is the example of the application of this multiple linear regression for this ELS data set. Question becomes, do we know or how do we know what is the ideal end members? And in this particular case, the answer is that, you know what, we can just take our data set and we can define the signal away from the interfaces as the known end members. So what we do is we take the whole data cube measured over this region and try to represent it at the linear combination of spectra from this region, this region, and this region. And it turns out that if we do that, we start to observe something remarkably interesting. If we choose the energy range from 35 to 125 electron volt. So this is the energy range in which the chemical phenomena manifest. In this case, we can represent our data very well as the linear combination of the spectra from the individual regions. 
So in fact, this fit is very good and our residual maps or height square map shows that there is nothing else in the image. At the same time, if we look at the energy range from 5 to 35 electron volt, so this is the region where the plasmons reside, you can see that we can still represent the spectra as the linear combination of these n-members. However, at one of the interfaces, we see that the error is very large. That means that there is some new type of behavior at the interface that cannot be represented as the linear combination of the individual elements. So in this particular case, it turns out that this happens because the, there is a structural reconstruction of the interface co uh, caused by the penetration of the zone uh, center modes from one material to another. And you can read more about it at this uh, publication by published in PRL about 10 years ago. Now, in this case, we assume that the end members are known. But what if the end members are unknown? So in this case, it turns out that we can still do remarkably a lot of things. In fact, we have a large collection of the linear mixing methods that allow us to work with the mixtures formed by the unknown components. The most simple of these techniques is the principal component analysis, which is pure information theory based and generally allows us to estimate how many components are in the mixture. The independent component analysis is considerably more complex methods, which allows us to essentially go against the law of the big numbers to separate the components in such a way as to increase their non-Gaussianity. There are techniques such as Bayesian linear unmixing or simpler version and find R and non-negative matrix factorization, which allow us to incorporate certain constraints, for example, additivity to one and the fact that the signal is non-negative. Now, one thing which is really important in discussion of this unmixing methods is that the convolution with the resolution function is also mixing, which means that if you perform the unmixing on the experimental data and you're concerned about the resolution effect, resolution is going to affect only your loading maps. So your end members, at least ideally, will remain the same. So resolution is important, but we can use these techniques independently on the resolution of the technique. So let's start from the principal component analysis. So we have discussed it several times in the one of the previous lectures. So just as a quick reminder, the PCA is based on the taking our original data set and representing it as a linear um, uh, superposition of the loadings and eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are orthonormal and are arranged in such a way that corresponding eigenvalues are placed in descending order by variance. So it is really convenient to separate the quote unquote real data from noise once we establish what is the cutoff criterion. So the first several eigenmembers tend to concentrate the useful information. It can be performed by the singular value decomposition, either in MATLAB or in Python and scikit-learn. Now, important thing is that PCA eigenvectors are determined in purely information theory sense, and they generally don't have defined physical meaning. Of course, they may have it for more complex reasons, but you really need to prove it in any specific case. And what's also important is that the principal component analysis is usually a starting point for many other mixing methods. So it's really something where you start most of the time, both for the exploratory data analysis and to prepare your data for more complex techniques. So let's look at several more complex examples on the PCA analysis on the ILS dataset. So this is the uh, ILS dataset on the calcium titanate, strontium titanate heterostructure. When we take our four-dimensional dataset, we plug it in uh, MATLAB in this case, and we extract the loading maps and the eigenvectors for several components. So you can start to see that our 
components clearly show you the difference between the uh, calcium titanate and strontium titanate region. You can see a very clear contrast in the first two components. You can see that some of the components look like they don't show other than anything other than noise. But if you look carefully, you will notice that, in fact, these components have a small number of uh, very strong pixels. And if you look at the corresponding loading maps, you can see that the noise in the system was actually filtered into specific PCA components. So, for example, for third component, you can see this pixel where all the noise, just one point in the image, have uh, been uh, separated. So that basically tells you that one of the important thing in the preparation of your data for the PCA or any other analysis is to clean up the outliers. Otherwise, each outlier is going to grab a full PCA component for itself. Another interesting thing that you are going to notice is that the useful information is contained only in the small number of the loading maps. In fact, I checked the subsequent maps don't have any spatially resolved information. And you can also see that we learn something about the chemical identity of this system. So, for example, the first two maps clearly separated calcium titanate and strontium titanate regions, whereas the fourth map shows more or less uniform contrast. So, given that the only thing common between calcium titanate and strontium titanate is, if you will, titanate, that immediately tells us that this component corresponds to the yield spectra of the titanium dioxide, whereas these components can be some linear combination of calcium and uh, strontium titanate, respectively. What's also interesting is that uh, this map shows us atomic uh, resolved features, and this is something that will come in handy down the line. Now, this is the more complex example of this uh, strontium titanate, lantern strontium manganate, Bithmut ferrite heterostructure. So in this case, we can also perform the uh, principal component analysis. And in this case, the data is remarkably more complicated. So you can see that there are some of the components show the atomic periodicities. Some of the components show only the mesoscale features. And there are a lot of interesting suggestions that something unusual may be happening on the interfaces. However, the principal component analysis can only suggest that something strange can be going on, but it cannot tell us exactly what it is. Uh, we can, of course, play further with this data. For example, we can take our loading maps, calculate their Fourier transforms, and see if we start to detect the atomic periodicities. It turns out that some of the map shows atomic periodicities, so you see the Fourier peaks. Some of them do not have atomic periodicities. So it basically tells us something about the signal localization in the EELS hyperspectral imaging. And uh, then, of course, the question becomes, what do the components mean? Well, we know that the first component is the average of the signal. However, given that the EELS signal is positive, that means that there are already second components. So don't forget they are supposed to be orthonormal. So that means that the second component will already have negative regions. So that is actually it's an, uh, unphysical. We know that some components will collect outliers. And what's also remarkable is that uh, if your signal has a periodic noise, very often this periodic noise would be confined to just two PCA components. Two because it's typically phase unsynchronized and therefore one component has the noise and another component has the periodic noise shifted by 180 degrees. So the conclusion that the PCA is absolutely greatest exploratory data analysis tool for the uh, hyperspectral data, it gives us insight into the spatial localization of the signals, but it really does not offer direct physical interpretation. And that tends to be a, a problem, so quite a lot of people uh, at the time when the PCA was introduced into the electron and scanning probe microscopy, that was roughly 14, 15 years ago, argued that PCA is not particularly useful because this analysis just doesn't respect the physics of the process. And to some extent it's correct. And again, it is a great exploratory data analysis tool. It's not a physics tool. The question becomes, 
can we make it a physical tool? And one way to do that is to implement the functional recognition imaging. So notice that this approach was suggested uh, 10 years ago. Now, instead of using the relatively simple shallow neural network, we would use the deep learning, but the principle is the same. So what is the functional recognition imaging? Imagine that we start with uh, some set of the materials, properties, and functionalities, which can be based either on internal standards, so the label data set, external standard, or the theoretical response. So these days, this would be supervised, unsupervised, or the transfer learning approaches. We simplify the signal to the uh, using the PCA to reduce the uh, dimensionality and to re remove the correlations. And we train the neural network using the these descriptors as the input and materials, functionalities, and output. So once the network is trained, it will be able to recognize the materials behaviors and transform them into the functionalities. So once we have the network, we take the experimental data set, perform the same dimensionality reduction or find the same descriptors, send it to the same network, and extract the set of material property maps. So this is the example. In this case, we take our calcium titanate, strontium titanate image. We use our neural network to train to recognize first and second component. And then we separate our data into the uh, relative fraction of the components. As you can see, we were able to actually separate our EELS data set into the component maps. And uh, of course, what we get very much depends on what type of network. So if we use a purely a linear neural, we have a good separation. If we have a tangential neuron, which is roughly equivalent to the logistic function, we will have a much sharper decision boundary corresponding to whether we deal with the calcium titanate or strontium titanate inside this material. So the same type of approach works for strontium titanate, lantern strontium manganate system. But in this case, the way our uh, system behaves very much depends on how many materials descriptors do we have. So for example, if we have three or four principal components, we can clearly separate strontium titanate, LSM, and B4 data sets. Once we have five components, we start to see the anomaly on the interface between the LSMO and BF4. And that looks very interesting, except that if we start to keep increasing the number of principal components, we start to see the anomalous behaviors even on the STLSMO behavior. So at that time, when we did this analysis, again, almost 10 years ago, we were not able to understand why it's happening, and therefore we never published it. And of course, now we know that this is a typical example of the overfitting when the networks just start to pay attention to the spurious changes in the contrast. The technique that turns out to be extremely useful in these cases, however, is the Bayesian linear unmixing that we discussed in the previous uh, lectures, where we try to take our EELS data set and separate it in the components which uh, are non-negative and sum to one. And in this case, it works like a charm. So using this BLU approach, we are able to separate our data set into the components which are perfectly indicative of the pure strontium titanate, LSMO, and BFO components. And what's nice, we can also get the corresponding end members, which represent the spectra for the pure faces. Now, there are other techniques we can use. For example, we can try to perform the k-means clustering on the same data set. So in this case, rather than trying to separate the data into the uh, linear mixing components, we try to separate into the non-overlapping clusters. And again, predictably, it works very well in this case. Now, what about analyzing the images? For the time being, we discuss the analysis of the spectral data sets. What about the images? We define the sub-image inside it, and uh, we perform the Fourier transform on each of the sub-images, and then we uh, transform the whole image set into the collection 
of the Fourier transform of the subimages. And then we can treat them as the hyperspectral data set and, for example, apply the same uh, linear and mixing on this FFT data sets. So this is the example of the image which clearly has two phases, the phase with the large unit cell and phase with the small unit cell. We transform it in the stack of the Fourier transforms and uh, perform the linear and mixing. And as you can see, if we do that, we can very well separate first phase and second phase. So the usual question in this case, how do you select the proper number of the components? And the answer is very simple. Uh, we can try to perform this unmixing with the two components, three components, four components, and then we look at the results. As you can see, for two components, it works perfectly. For three components, we identify the interface as the original phase. And for four components, we start to separate one of the phases in the additional components. And it's very easy to detect once the separation starts to fail. What is remarkable is that this method works, of course, not only for ideal synthetic data sets, it also works for the experimental data. And this is the example of the image of the complex uh, oxide catalyst where you can see the coexistence of two phases, the hexagonal phase and much more complex phase. And as you can see, this Bayesian linear mixing separates the phases remarkably well. So our first component is actually the empty space. And this is how the Fourier transform of the empty space look like. Our second component, which sits inside, purely inside the hexagonal phase, has a beautiful uh, Fourier transform. And our third component is this uh, partially disordered phase, which has, is localized within this grain and has a very distinctive Fourier transform with the set of this uh, interpenetrating rings. So the sliding Fourier transform by Asian linear and mixing really works like a charm when you have to work with the image segmentation problems and you try to identify the elementary phases inside the of course, it works not only for chemical phases, it also works for the uh, separation of the physical systems when we can have uh, several interpenetrating order parameters. And this is the example of the scanning transmission electron, uh, so scanning tunneling microscopy of ruthenium trichloride, which can be in the uh, dimer phase or the non dimerized phase, and our Bayesian linear and mixing applied to the Fourier transform can separate the regions of the different order. And you can see that they have a remarkably different spatial localization. So this approach works remarkably well. So you can read more about this an analysis in several publications. So one is by Rama Vasudevan on the determination of phases and interfaces from real space atomically resolved data. Another is the analysis of the ruthenium trichloride and the application of the sliding Fourier transform um, for STM as well. Now, what are other examples of the machine learning applied in STEM? So the very interesting technique in this regard is the four-dimensional STEM or the tychographic imaging. So what this technique is, is the diffraction in the wonderland. So think about it this way. Imagine that you have a crystalline material and you shine an electron beam on it. And assume that the size of the electron beam, sort of, it's almost like a parallel wave, is much larger than the distance between the atoms or scatterers inside the solid. So in this case, you will get a normal diffraction pattern, which is formed by multiple well-visible Fourier peaks. And these Fourier peaks are very narrow. Imagine that you make the size of your, of your beam much smaller. So the beam size becomes only slightly larger than the size of the uh, distance between the scatterers. In this case, the Fourier peaks become considerably broader. And instead of the very sharp peaks, we start to see the disks. So this is the general principle. The smaller is the beam, the broader is the Fourier peak. And once we start to make our beam smaller than the distance between the scatterer, we'll get to the regime 
when the size of these disks start to become much larger than the distance between them. So we start to have a series of the overlapping disks, which gives rise to very complex pattern of the signal. And the important thing is that the signal contains the information of very fine detail of the atomic structure. So this is something that we really want to be able to explore and understand. And uh, you can read more about the perspective of this uh, method in the opinion piece that Andy Lupini, Mark Oxley, and myself have published in Science about a year ago. The question, of course, becomes, uh, if we collect this data, what are we going to do with this? Because by the definition, if you have your beam size much smaller than the distance of the scatterers, that means that uh, you don't have a one-dimensional data set anymore. You have a four-dimensional data set because you are going to be able to measure this diffraction pattern at each point on the sample surface. So how we are going to treat with uh, and explore this data set? So the answer is that we are also going to do it using the uh, exploratory data analysis that can be based on the statistical admixing. So one way we can analyze this data set is perform the Fourier transform. So in this case, we start with the collection of the 4D stem data. We transform it in the Fourier domain. And now we can have a beautiful representation of the data in terms of the Fourier grams. And you can explore it and you can see that if there is a symmetry breaking in this system, you are also going to see the splitting of these Fourier spots. Another way we can work with this data is to analyze it through the principal component analysis. So this is how it looks like. So we, this is our PCA components, and uh, these are the corresponding loading maps. The important thing is that in this case, there are a lot of them. So we start with the four-dimensional data set that's formed by, for example, uh, 500 by 500 points in the real space and same number of points in the case space, we can show that we can reduce it to several hundred of the significant components. So it's better than original tens of thousands, but it's still a lot of important components. Nonetheless, the first several components already start to give us insight into the spatial localization of the signal. And uh, this is an example of the workflow for the analysis of such data when we collect the uh, Ronke gram at each point on the sample surface. We represent them as the data set. So this is how the data look like. If you look at it very, very carefully, you can see that the variability of the Ronke gram changes. So if you look at it at the distance, you can see the localization of the atomic columns inside the material, but it's not very easy. However, if we just average the signal, we can start to see that there is a domain boundary inside this material, which goes from diagonally here. And if we use the representation through the PCA components, we start to map the characteristic behaviors of this Ronke gram. So we see that the contrast is different between the different uh, domains, and we see that there is a well visible grain boundary inside. So we can get further inside if you look at the maps of the individual components or the k-means clustering. But as I said, that's a great tool for the exploratory data analysis, which allows us to see what's there inside the material. And uh, so this is the example of the k-means clustering when we represent the clusters corresponding to identical Ronkengram behaviors. Again, you can read more about this analysis and uh, this publication about three years ago. Now, the important thing about the high resolution imaging is that what we get is basically more than just observing the atoms. So the question is why? And the answer is that modern electron microscopy allows us to localize atoms and their positions down to picometer level precision. And that's really it can tell us a whole lot about the material's properties. For example, if you're a chemist and someone tells you the distance between the carbon atoms and the molecule, you will be able to say a whole lot about the chemical reactivity of this material, 
or its uh, physical properties. If you're a physicist and someone tells you what is the distance between metal oxygen and metal atom or corresponding angle, you would be able to say whether this material is ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic, whether this is uh, metal or insulator and so on and so forth. The important thing is that until very recently, this type of information was available only from scattering studies. You have to use the X-ray or go to the synchrotron or go to the neutron, uh, neutron source. Now, this level of structural information is available directly from the observation of the atomic position. And what you see here is a movie which shows the dynamics of the silicon atom inside the graphene analyzed using the deep learning when we see how the atomic structure of the carbon reconfigures during the beam induced process. So you see not only the physics, but also the chemical reactivity of the material in real time. Question comes, how can we extract this information? So one way to do that is to rely on the natural physics descriptors. For example, we can take atomic coordinates and extract polarization or octahedratils or strains, for example, physical strains or the Weggard or chemical strains. And I'm going to talk about these methods in the next lecture. In this lecture, however, we are going to talk about the exploratory data analysis on the atomically resolved data. So the difference between the sliding windows and the local atom-based methods is the following. In the sliding window methods, we take the image and analyze it as a sub-image at a time. In the atom-based methods, we take the image, find all the atomic positions, and analyze it as a collection of atoms. How do we start? So the first, first thing that we can start with is to use the machine learning methods to construct the intrinsic descriptors from the bottom up. And we can start doing it from the level of the individual atomic column shape. So look at this image. So here you look at the experiment or the uh, simulated data set of the bismuth ferrite uh, for the images simulated in the different projections. And if you look at these images, you can see that the shape of the atomic columns corresponding to the cation is not exactly the, the same. The reason for this is happens because these columns are formed not only by cation but also by the oxygen atoms. In one case, the oxygen atom would be, say, on the uh, bottom uh, left, and the other case, they would be on the top right. And uh, this uh, zigzag between the metal and oxygen atoms makes the atomic column have this characteristic shape. So we can play with this, uh, for example, using the different projections. We can play with it using different uh, instrumental settings in the simulation. But in all cases, we can conclude that the shape of the column actually contains some information. And this information is uh, on the uh, octahedral tilt in the Z direction along the beam, uh, along the beam axis. So the question becomes, uh, can we learn this information? So we know now that the column shape is determined by the ordering in this direction. It can be a descriptor of the structure. It is affected by the imaging conditions. So question is, can we use the intrinsic statistical properties within the image to analyze the structure? And the answer is yes, we can. If we take the theoretical image and uh, find each atomic column, and then perform the principal component analysis, you can see that our first component is just average. It looks like a circle, and the corresponding map is uniform. But our second component looks like a shift. So this means that it is either increasing intensity in this direction and decreasing in this direction. And the corresponding map looks like a checkerboard. So the presence of the shapes, uh, ordered shapes in this column reflected in the checkerboard pattern in the shape PCA. In comparison, the next component already has a much smaller amount of information and there is no spatial resolved map. So great, it works on the simulated data. Will it work on the experimental data?
And the answer is yes, it will work remarkably well. So now we are looking at the experimental data set of the stem image of the bismuth ferrite. Notice that even by eye, you can see the subtle difference between the contrast here and here. But by eye, it's really difficult to analyze, so it's not a very quantitative measure. So it turns out that if we find the positions of all atomic columns and perform the uh, principal component analysis on the column shape, we can remarkably separate the two regions. So in the first PCA component, so this is our uh, average atomic shape and this is our loading map. We don't see much here. This is our second component. We can cl see clear difference between the column shapes here and here. So these are our two phases. And this is our third component when we start to see the checkerboard pattern within this image. So based purely on the exploratory data analysis, we were able to separate the two regions within the material and we were able to find the uh, checkerboard ordering within one of those regions. Of course, that's not ideal. We, again, it is information theory based tool. It's not a physics based tool. So we see some vestiges of the checkerboard ordering both in the first and second component. But nonetheless, we did what we wanted. We were able to separate the regions with the different physical behavior and uh, quantify what type of ordering these regions have. Now, so given this success, maybe we can come up with a more generalized way of uh, analyzing the atomically resolved data. And this is the workflow suggested by Alex Belyaninov when he was a postdoc in the scanning probe microscopy group. So basically what we start with is we start with the image. We do the usual cleaning and denoising. We find all the atoms inside the image and refine their coordinates, for example, using the Gaussian or Lorenzen fit. And then we create a set of the atomic descriptions, descriptors. For example, for each atom, we specify its nearest neighborhood. And uh, then we can tailor this distribution for specific physical problems. So in some cases, we may want to analyze only the distribution of the distance from the central atom to its neighbors. Sometimes we can analyze the angle. Sometimes we can analyze the uh, areas of the unit cell or any combination thereof. And then we take this uh, set of descriptors and uh, send it to the statistical engine, which can either cluster them based on the k-means or principal component analysis. And that allows us to find the characteristic cluster behavior, so the chemical type of atoms. It allows us to separate the small structural distortions, so to perform the physics-based analysis. And it also allows us to reconstruct the ideal lattice property. So this is the example of this local crystallography approach for the same uh, mixed material, mixed oxide material. So we have the, uh, the uh, electron microscopy image. We find all the atoms. And then we perform the k-means clustering. And based on the k-means clustering, we can identify the atoms which have uh, similar structural behavior, sort of, which are chemically identical. And then we can see how these atoms are organized in the real space. So what you see here is two examples. One is based on the uh, bond lengths, another is based on the bond angles. So this is the closer view on the structure of the individual clusters. So basically, we take all the atoms inside the material, atomic columns as it may be, we separate them based on the chemical similarity, and then we see how these chemically similar groups are organized in the real space. And you can clearly see that, for example, this is one phase, this is the order part of the second phase, and this is, for example, the third phase, which we cannot clearly see, but clearly forms a cluster of well-defined behaviors. So you can learn more about this uh, atom-based analytics and this publication. So starting from uh, our first work for local crystallography analysis for STM, all the way to applications of the machine learning through local crystallography and analysis of the ruthenium chloride and more complex algorithms for atom finding that have been published very recently.
Now, what can we do further with this type of data? Well, first of all, if we find all the atoms in the image, we can make a transition and make a libraries of the defects existing in this image. So what you see on this slide is an example of the silicon in the graphene data sets when we acquired several hundred of the image frames. We found all the atoms here, and then we calculated the statistics of all the defects inside. So we got a library of the defects. And Maxim is going to talk about this in one of the next presentations in this lecture series. In fact, uh, we can not only create the libraries, but we can also use these libraries in order to add the electronic structure. For example, we can take the atomic coordinates from the images, send it to our uh, theory colleagues who is going to calculate for us the uh, perspective scanning tunneling microscopy spectra. And you can read more about it in uh, this preprint. In fact, we can even take the sample, transfer it from the electron microscope and the scanning tunneling microscope and get the several images of the surface electronic properties. And with a very high degree of probability, we can identify some of the defects in the STM image based on the predictions from the electronic structure from the electron microscopy data set. Turns out that this is actually a remarkably complex experiment because once you transfer the sample from electron to scanning probe microscope, it can get damaged and so on and so forth. But it worked at least once. And what's important is that uh, the collection of the images that's generated in this experiment is now publicly available from the Citrin, Citrin Nation platform. You can learn more about this in these uh, two publications, so the uh, Material Research Bulletin and the Archive. Now, what else can we do? It turns out that uh, with the deep learning methods, we can actually do quite a lot. So this is the example of the uh, experimental evolution of the tungsten sulfide under the electron beam. So what you see here is how the electron beam kicks out the sulfur atoms and creates point defects. The point defects organize to form the extended defects and then they form the nuclei the new phase. So from the point of view of pure electron microscopy, this is essentially a beam damage. So something bad is going on. From the point of view of the solid state chemistry, this is a, a remarkable collection of information on how material is reduced when we observe this reduction process one atom at a time. So this is truly exciting. And uh, what we try to do here is to extract the useful information from this data set. And to do that, we created a deep learning network that finds point defects and only point defects. Once the defects are found, they're classified. So we can get a collection of these defects. Then we can represent the evolution of the system through this uh, space-time trajectory. So what you see here is the xy plane. So this is our image plane. Frame is the time frame. And what you can see is that some of the defects appear and disappear. So this is a random generation recommendation process. Some defects kind of wiggle, so they form these trajectories. And for those defects, we can analyze uh, the, essentially the diffusion coefficient. And interestingly, some of the defects stay in place. So you can see this kind of rods going through the uh, space-time region. And if we look at these defects more carefully, we can see that they stay in place, but they change type. And the reason why this happens is because this defect correspond to the, uh, the dopant molybdenum atom that can form a complex with the sulfur vacancy. So this complex exists in uh, three possible configurations, and we also can have the uh, pure molybdenum atom. So there are four possible configurations of these defects, and you can see that how under the action of the electron beam they switch from one form to another. And of course, when we have a process like this, we can even analyze it through the simple uh, Markov chain model. and this is great because basically what we get is to analyze the beam and use solid state reaction uh, 
one defect at a time and determine the associated kinetics. And you can read more about this work uh, in this publication. Many of these advances are based on the deep learning. It really works like a charm for problems like drift correction, denoising, data processing, and feature finding. So what I show here is just a brief example is how well the deep learning works for the atomically resolved data sets. So you can see here the silicon atom jumping inside the graphene under the action of the electron beam. This is how the original data looks like. And this is how the data analyzed by the deep learning network look like. So the intensity of the red and green color correspond to the probability density of this pixel belonging to carbon atom or silicon atom. And you can see that it works really fantastically. And of course, for this type of analytics, we can also try to describe the structure of the solid through the elementary descriptors. And this is the example of how we take these data sets and use the Gaussian mixture model in order to separate them into the possible structural units. And uh, once we define them, so they look like molecules. In fact, they're not exactly molecules. This is purely statistical analysis of data. But even for these units, we can find the probability matrix and the individual reactions. So these were just a very few examples of the applications of the machine learning in the electron microscopy. I think that now is a very exciting time because our field is positioned on the brink of transition from individual microscopists running a microscope to much more collective uh, mode of operation, similar to uh, high energy physics or astronomy, which will allow us to fully capture the instrumental data stream coordinate the protocols and data metadata from the different regions to perform the community-wide analytics. And the tools that will enable this are deep learning, statistical reconstructions, data sharing, and tools like Google Collabs or Jupyter Papers that will allow us to integrate and share data and code across the community. So you can read more about this work and some of the thoughts in this following publications and uh, stay tuned so in the next lecture we are going to talk about the physics extraction from stem data and after that we are going to talk about the electron beam atomic manipulation thank you for your attention